No, he won't listen to me. No. No, he won't listen to you either. Well, well, who should we send? I don't know. What about Heinz? Yeah? Yeah, okay, cool. Heinz, yeah. August 29th, 1941. This war grows bigger and bigger as the months roll on. And this week is no exception. This week, Britain and the Soviet Union invade Iran. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, Joseph Stalin issued orders that will brand any of his commanders who surrender under any circumstances traitors. Hitler again ordered his main attacks in the Soviet Union to turn from the center to the north and south, and the evacuation of the Australians from Tobruk and their replacement by Polish and Czechoslovak units began and continues this week. Some major news this week comes from those newest of allies, Britain and the Soviet Union. On the 25th, apparently worried by reports of German tourists entering Iran, the two demand that Iran accept their protection of its oil supplies and they send their forces into the country. The British forces are led on land by Edward Quainan, with Navy support by Jeffrey Arbuthnot. The advances in two regions, one to take the oil installations near Abadan and one coming from Iraq towards Kerman Shah. That last commanded by William Slim, who we've seen in Syria and East Africa so far this year. British landings are made at Bandar Shapur, Abadan, and Khorram Shah. They sink a couple of small Iranian warships and seize some German merchant shipping. The Soviets are in three columns under Vasily Novikov's command, one heading for Tabriz, while the other two advance on either side of the Caspian Sea. All three columns make good progress, and the Soviets bomb Tabriz. On the 26th, the British take control of the Abadan region. The Soviets enter Tabriz and bomb Tehran. The 27th, the British take Shahabad towards Kerman Shah, and in the south take Awaz. The Iranian government resigns. The 28th, a new government takes office in Iran under Ali Farugi and orders a ceasefire. Negotiations with the British and Soviets begin, and on the 29th, the fighting comes to an end in Iran. The British and Soviets will link up the 31st at Kazvin. Looking into the future, on September 9th, the Iranian government will agree on the final terms. The invaders will occupy certain points in the country, but agree to stay out of Tehran. This invasion is Operation Countenance. Another operation launched the 25th is Operation Gauntlet, in which British, Canadian, and Norwegian commandos raid Spitsbergen up near the North Pole and destroy stores of coal, oil reserves, and mining machinery. The Soviets and Norwegians want to deny their installations there to the Germans. They also evacuate 2,000 Russian civilians to Archangel. They also evacuate 50 French officers. Yep. You see, those guys had been captured by the Germans in May last year and sent to a POW camp in East Prussia. They escaped from there to the Soviet Union and from there had hoped to join the Free French, but the Soviets interned them on Spitsbergen. They are now free. There is a lot of action in other northern parts this week in the Soviet Union. On the 23rd, Klim Voroshilov sends the 48th Red Army to defend attacks on Leningrad from the southeast. The Stavka then divide Marky and Popov's northern front, though, into the Leningrad front, still under Popov, and the Karelian front under V.A. Frolov. Then on the 27th, the GKO, the State Defense Committee, takes direct control of these fronts and the northwestern front by dissolving Northwestern High Command and merging its staff with the Leningrad Front. This ends Voroshilov's control over the military situation at Leningrad. But German Army Group North Commander Wilhelm von Lieb's forces are on the move. Rudolf Schmidt's 39th Motorized Corps capture Lieb on the 25th and his units reach the Neva River the 29th. The 18th Motorized Division from the 29th Corps take Kirishi and threatens to split the Soviets defending southeast of Leningrad. On the 29th, the Germans take Mega, cutting the last railway link between Leningrad and the rest of the Soviet Union. Lieb orders his forces that day to surround Leningrad. Also in the area, on the 28th, Tallinn falls to German forces and Estonian volunteers. Now, 27th, 23,000 Soviet military personnel and sympathetic civilians are evacuated from Tallinn in the Baltic Dunkirk. Vladimir Tributz of the Red Navy 
has the Baltic fleet of 190 ships there that have to cross nearly 250 kilometers of water between two coasts occupied by the Germans. The waters are mined and the Soviets have no aerial support. So between mines, the Luftwaffe and German coastal guns, 25 of the 29 large transport ships are sunk. Martin Gilbert says 10,000 people total perish, though some sources place the number as over 12,000. And even further north this week, on the 28th, the Finns take Vipuri. They are not far from reaching their former border positions that fell to the USSR last year. The Soviets are also losing some ground in the center this week. Semyon Timoshenko's Western Front has been fighting for nearly two weeks solid, but its mission has been expanded to take Velizh, Demidov, and Smolensk. But so far, his 22nd and 29th armies have been pushed back by Hermann Hoth's panzers, and the 22nd is surrounded near Veliki Luki and savaged. By the 26th, Veliki Luki falls, yielding 34,000 prisoners and 300 guns to the Germans. But Army Group Center Commander Fedor von Bock is aware that this sort of limited offensive is not going to destroy the Red Army. And he writes the 25th that his armies, which have been mainly on defense lately, can't hold much longer the way things look now. I am being forced to spread the reserve which I so laboriously scraped together for the hoped-for attack behind my front just to have some degree of security that it will not be breached. If, after all the successes, the campaign in the East now trickles away in dismal defensive fighting for my army group, it is not my fault. He has reason for dismay. Since a couple of days earlier, he and Army Command Chief of Staff Franz Halder give Panzer Group Commander Heinz Guderian the task of persuading Adolf Hitler to drive on towards Moscow instead of diverting forces to the north and south. On the 23rd, Bach requests that Guderian be granted an audience. So Guderian heads to Rastenburg, but before he sees Hitler, he is greeted by Army Commander Walter von Brauchisch, who tells him, I forbid you to mention the question of Moscow to the Fuhrer. The operation to the south has been ordered. The problem now is simply how it is to be carried out. Discussion is pointless. Guderian has to obey this. But during the discussion with Hitler, drops hint after hint about Army Group Center's major objective until Hitler brings it up himself. So now that Guderian has his chance, he launches into his spiel for plowing on towards Moscow. Hitler does hear him out, but then tells Guderian that he and the other commanders know nothing about the economic aspects of the war. And the main job is to seize the Soviet Union's southern economic zone and the Crimea. Everyone in the room, including Keitel, Jodl, and Schmunt, agrees with Hitler. So Guderian is obliged to back down. Though he gets the concession that once the Battle of Kiev is won, his panzers can return to the Moscow road. Guderian is in the doghouse with Halder, Braukic, and Bach after this. But that is it. The offensive will go full force to the south. Its opposition, as I mentioned last week, is Andrei Yeremenko's new Bryansk front, which will attack Guderian's panzers on a long front from Zhukovka to Yampil. Actually, Stavka has dissolved the Red Army's central front and reinforced Yeremenko and given him much of the central front sector. Central front commander Mikhail Efremov is now Yeremenko's deputy. So the Bryansk front is the 50th, 13th, and 21st armies which cumulatively can hopefully halt Guderian. But already by midweek, elements of his panzer group and Maximilian von Weich's second army start attacks to link up east of Kiev with army group south. However, the terrain down there east of the Dnieper and north of Kiev is difficult, and Mikhail Potapov's 5th Red Army is holding up. So at least the German infantry is being slowed. Army Group South Commander Gerd von Rundstedt is worried that the Soviets will withdraw and escape. So at the end of the week, he orders Panzer Group Kleist and the 6th and 17th Armies to cross the Dnieper at as many points as possible and not to worry about their flanks. On the Dnieper, though, the Soviets destroy the Zaporozhye Dam. The dynamiting of the dam seriously raises the water level of the river, floods and destroys villages along the river without warning, and kills many thousands, and perhaps tens of thousands of civilians. It also kills a fair amount of Red Army soldiers crossing the river. The dynamiting is done by NKVD agents and reportedly is hurriedly done. 
American journalist H.R. Knickerbocker writes, the Russians have proved now that they truly mean to scorch the earth before Hitler, even if it means the destruction of their most precious possessions. It was an object almost of worship to the Soviet people. Its destruction demonstrates a will to resist which surpasses anything we had imagined. I know what that dam meant to the Bolsheviks. The Dnieper Dam, when it was built, was the biggest on earth. Stalin's order to destroy it meant more to the Russians emotionally than it would mean to us for Roosevelt to order the destruction of the Panama Canal. That is some pretty big news. There is other news leaking from warring nations this week as well, though more of the secret kind. From August 23rd and continuing into next week, Bletchley Park gives the British Enigma intercepts of 17 German police messages from their eastern zones to Berlin, which lay out the details of the murders of Jews. At Kamenetz Podolsk, many Jews are being murdered this week. They had been deported by the Hungarian government. However, the German authorities tried to send them back since they could not cope with them. The Hungarian government refused, so SS General Jekyll took charge of the situation. He has the Jews march to some bomb craters outside the city, undressed and then mown down by machine guns. Many die from the weight of others falling on top of them. The job is done by the 29th, and Operational Situation Report number 80 gives the exact number of those shot as 23,600 in three days. Winston Churchill broadcasts the 24th about what is going on in German-occupied Eastern Europe. Whole districts are being exterminated. Scores of thousands, literally scores of thousands of executions in cold blood are being perpetrated by the German police troops. We are in the presence of a crime without name. Churchill does not refer specifically to Jews, though. Had he done so, it might have alerted the Germans that the British are intercepting their top secret messages. But there is civilian unease about some of the Nazi programs, even at home in Germany. In fact, public unease in Germany over the T4 euthanasia program has been growing and growing. This week on the 24th comes Hitler's order to end the program, though it does officially end, many people will continue to meet their deaths because of what certain doctors deem mental or physical defects. Under the codename T4, 80,000 mental patients, a great many of them children, have been put to death between September 1939 and now. That's more than 100 per day. And with that, I will end the week. A week that sees the invasion and submission of Iran, the fall of Tallinn, a disaster at sea, a disaster on a Soviet river in Ukraine, and Guderian failing to change Hitler's mind. Something to consider here. So far this summer, the war has been an epic disaster for the Soviets with a colossal wastage of men and material, sure, but unlike the German army, the Red Army does not have to win the war in 1941. It just has to survive long enough for the Germans to exhaust themselves. On August 23rd in Berlin, German Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop tells the Japanese Ambassador General Hiroshi Oshima that the war against the Soviet Union may well last into 1942. On the 27th, an OKW memorandum says that the campaign will have first priority in 1942. And Franz Halder writes to his wife this week on the 23rd, the goal which I had set myself to achieve namely to finish off the Russians in this year, will not be attained, and we will have a strength-draining Eastern Front over the winter. If you would like to see our coverage of another far, far larger disaster in Ukraine than that dam being busted, you can watch our Between Two Wars episode about the Holodomor right here. Our Time Ghost Army member of the week is Benjamin Newman. The Time Ghost Army funds all of our documentary work. So for more in-depth and groundbreaking series, join the Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. See you next time.